Let's start our session about uh, troubleshooted.NET application. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Sergei Matukevich. I'm a cloud engineer from Altoros. Uh, I'm sure you have probably already seen this slide. So, but for those who didn't, yeah. So for those who didn't, please review it because it contains important uh, fire announcement. But uh, while you're reading, let me very quickly introduce myself. So uh, I started as a .NET developer uh, seven years ago, but then I moved to DevOps stuff completely. And I can claim that I have seen the platform from both points of view, as a developer and as a DevOps. And my uh, current topic is closely related to uh, both of those experiences. So uh, today, we are going to talk about efficient ways to troubleshoot uh, .NET application deployed to Cloud Foundry. Uh, I can split the topic of troubleshooting .NET application into three, three broad areas. So first of all, we are going to talk about how to utilize logs. Uh, we will see how we can use structured logging to efficiently log messages and help platform to aggregate those logs and present them for us. We will talk a little bit about monitoring as well, uh, how we can use monitoring to notify us if something goes wrong with the platform. And finally, we will talk about uh, debugging and remote debugging of .NET application uh, deployed to Cloud Foundry platform. Uh, a few important things that you need to know about logging in uh, Cloud Foundry, and uh, this is related to most cloud platforms. So first of all, your application is not uh, supposed to log anything into log files. So instead, you should print output of your logs into standard, R, uh, standard out of your process. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it is important uh, to know that uh, platform is responsible for aggregating and uh, handling logs uh, for you. So later, you can consume those logs and utilize them and use some log aggregation uh, frameworks that I'm going to show you a little bit uh, later in my presentation. Another important concept that is related to logging in a cloud application is called structured log. So what does it mean is that uh, usually you don't just uh, print uh, some string message in, uh, as your log message, uh, you attach some important information to each of your message. And this allows later to very efficiently uh, sort your messages, filter your messages, and uh, drill down into an error if you had uh, one. Uh, and uh, later I will show you how we can utilize facilities provided for us by .NET Framework to implement such kind of logging. Uh, here is the code that uh, does this for a sample uh, ISP.NET Core application. So the top code snippet is responsible for configuring logger. So here I'm using serilog library to implement structured logging, but that's uh, not as important because almost all logging libraries, like nlogs, for example, or log4net, implement similar kind of uh, features. So here we configure uh, default log level for standard libraries because we don't want to be overflown with uh, messages from uh, Microsoft namespace and system namespace. But the most important line here is the one where we uh, configure that we are going to write our message to console. So uh, that's essential for cloud application because as I said previously, we don't want to log into files, we just output everything to console. And also, we are using JSON formatter. So if you use JSON formatter, this allows you to wrap your messages in JSON object and attach uh, fields or text to each message that later can be used to search for uh, logs. And second code snippet is uh, configuring the uh, application itself. And the most important, important uh, line here is the one that says, uh, use serilog. This is extension method that actually applies previously configured logger to current application and allows ISP.NET Core app to use this logger. Next, after we have our uh, logger configured, we can try to utilize our uh, logger. But what we really want to achieve is to transparently add 
those kind of tags that I was uh, telling you previously to all our messages. We don't want to attach request ID and user ID each time we log in something. And that's where middleware comes into play. This is a very useful method to implement some functionality before and after your request is processed. So here you can see that we are uh, writing some string uh, to uh, log before the request, after the request, and most importantly, we use begin scope method of ISP.NET Core Logger, and this method allows us to create custom scope. What does it mean is that it creates a new field that is gonna be attached to each subsequent message in this scope. By default, ISP.NET Core creates scope for each request and it attaches such fields as request ID. We will talk how to very efficiently use request ID later. But nobody prevents you from create custom scopes. And it's not necessarily should be the case that you should wrap only request into custom scopes. You can uh, wrap any other uh, functionality into custom scopes as well. So uh, if we are Talking about custom scopes, uh, there, uh, there are a few important things that I want to highlight. So, uh, first of all, scopes allows you to make your login uh, transparent for the code. So you don't attach user ID and scope ID each time you log in something. Uh, instead, you use such facilities as custom middleware or custom filters to do this job for you. And uh, secondly, it ensures uh, consistent login format, so you know that request ID is gonna be uh, attached to each message. And then you can uh, utilize this when filtering for your uh, messages. And as I said previously, you can wrap uh, any other kind of functionality, for example, request to database. Tra uh, transaction, database transactions can be wrapped in a custom logger scope if a lot of work is, gonna be, uh, is going to be done during the process, processing of this transaction. Uh, let me uh, also show you a few fields that I usually consider uh, to be important when uh, talking about logging. So first of all, if we are talking about custom scopes, so usually we attach ADs that later can be used to filter our messages. Uh, the most important one is request ID, but also it's important uh, to attach user ID, maybe thread ID if you are doing some uh, multi-threaded uh, processing during your action method uh, execution. Uh, but uh, also, those fields are used to filter uh, your messages. But also it is important to trace everything that goes inside your application and goes outside it. So what do I mean by that? So uh, it's a good practice to uh, log uh, the content of your request because later you can reproduce this request. And uh, if you rely on custom headers, for example, you can log completely the, uh, the uh, uh, the whole request. Also, it is important to log everything that you send to external system and you can consider your database as external system. So you can log your SQL queries and later you can analyze performance and uh, find uh, bottlenecks when uh, analyzing those queries. And if you talk to some external system, it's also uh, useful to log this. And uh, the main idea why I uh, pay so much attention to this because this login can be implemented in a consistent way using such techniques as I showed you previously with custom middleware. For example, you can use your ORM to attach some login information before each request and after each request. Uh, okay, at this point of time, we have our login configured for our simple application and it brings something to standard output and Call Founder is responsible for collecting those messages. Now we need to talk a little bit how we can utilize uh, this and how we can filter our messages and uh, search them. So in my presentation, I'm uh, showing you screenshots from applications that is called Kibana. And here I'm using a very popular stack that is used very commonly with Cloud Foundry that is called ELK, Elasticsearch Logstash Kibana. So this stack is responsible for 
taking messages from uh, Cloud Foundry, storing them, and later Kibana, this is the uh, screenshot from this application, provides you a way to see your log messages. And here you can see that we have three messages, something that, uh, two messages from our custom middleware, and the important thing here is that our uh, custom field uh, is attached to all of the messages, and we also see that request ID is attached here. Uh, very briefly, I want to explain how uh, ELK stack works. So Cloud Foundry by itself doesn't provide you any uh, possibility to uh, efficiently search for logs. Instead, Cloud Foundry just provides you a way to grab all logs from the system, and it should be a responsibility of some other system to uh, collect those logs, uh, store them and uh, uh, provide search and filter uh, possibilities. So uh, the application that collects logs from Cloud Foundry is called Firehose Nozzle. Then logs are sent to intermediate buffer. Usually we use Redis for this. Um, uh, then there is a component that is called Elastic uh, Log Stash. So Log Stash uh, takes JSON strings from an input, the ones that we have been uh, logged uh, previously, and uh, convert them to an object. And those objects are stored in uh, Elasticsearch, and later Kibana can talk directly to Elasticsearch and uh, take log messages out of there. This is very briefly how it works. Uh, so now I want to show you how we can use uh, this to search for logs in case if something happens. So for example, let's consider a very common scenario. We have uh, an error in our application. So uh, first of all, we find our error message with stack trace in uh, Kibana, and then we can use request ID field attached to this message. We can use this request ID to filter all message and uh, messages that belongs to this particular request. Then we can uh, analyze what parameters have been sent to us. We know which user was, uh, uh, in, in context of which user our request have been executed. So we uh, have basically all necessary data to fully reproduce the request if we need. Uh, and uh, usually this, sh this should be enough to troubleshoot any kind of error. And from my point of view, a, a good way to say that, okay, I'm doing login right for my platform is that if you can troubleshoot any issue just by using logs, uh, then uh, you are really logging enough information and uh, you are really logging information that is necessary for you so are not overflowed with some unnecessary information and um, that doesn't help you uh, in, uh, during debugging your application. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, metrics and how we can use them in uh, Cloud Foundry and uh, utilize metrics from .NET applications. So if logs are mostly used to troubleshoot some issue, like in the example that I discussed previously, we have an error and then we use logs to uh, troubleshoot the issue, metrics usually are used to uh, send a notification that something is wrong with your system, like uh, disk utilization is too high, or uh, memory, uh, we are going out of memory, or we're having too many requests and our application cannot keep up with them. By default, Cloud Foundry provides you, uh, uh, provide you a possibility to access basic metrics, uh, such as, for example, disk utilization, memory utilization, number of requests, average time of processing the request, and those metrics are very useful. And if we are using PCFs, there is an application that is called PCF metrics, and those metrics are available uh, by default, and you can just open dashboard and see how disk utilization changes over time. Uh, but uh, that's actually easy to, very, very easy to use, but what I really want to focus on is how you can create your custom metrics. Uh, creating custom metrics can be very 
uh, useful because obviously Cloud Foundry doesn't know anything about your application business logic. It doesn't know when your customer logs in into the system or when some important event happened, when an error happened, uh, and uh, so on. So it's usually useful to, uh, when designing your application, to come up with a few important metrics. And here I'm showing you how you can very simply send value for some particular uh, some metric. Uh, and I'm using uh, Graphite for this. So Graphite is a time series database that can store values for some metrics. And later we can use other software to visualize those metrics. So let's see how it works on example. Uh, if we... Uh, this is a diagram taken from uh, one of uh, products that is called Heartbeat that is um, doing exactly this. It hosts a uh, time series database and connects to Cloud Foundry and grabs all default metrics out of the system. By default metrics, I mean metrics that came from virtual machines where our Cloud Foundry is hosted. I also mean metrics came from the platform itself. Uh, and um, uh, from uh, all components of the platform. Uh, but also there is a way for your application, like I showed you previously, to send metrics directly to this database. This is very useful if you want to compare two metrics. For example, you want to see how disk utilization changes when uh, logging, uh, number of login attempts grows over time, for example. Or you want to correlate two metrics, one of which is application specific and uh, other is platform specific. And such kind of solution provide you a way to do this. Uh, so all of them are stored in time series database and we use an application that is uh, called uh, Grafana to visualize those metrics. So actually on my previous slides there's a sample of graph how, uh, that can be built uh, in uh, Grafana to visualize some uh, metric. And uh, the last functionality uh, that is very important is uh, alerting. So if you have some metric, usually you want to be notified when something runs, uh, when this, the value of this metric goes beyond some threshold. For example, if uh, the, uh, CPU utilization goes beyond uh, 80%. And as, uh, usually monitoring tools allows you to use logic uh, to say, okay, when this event happened, I want to uh, email to be sent to system administrators. And uh, this interface shows you an example how we can create such uh, queries and how we can use value of particular metric to notify user. So, uh, same as for logs, I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what kind of metrics uh, I consider uh, to uh, what kind of metrics are important to be monitored. Uh, so first of all, uh, default metrics that we talked about previously definitely are very important. Container metrics, CPU, memory, disk, number of requests, request latency. If we are talking about application specific metrics, from my previous experience I can say that the most important one are is database metrics. Because I have seen a lot of times uh, situation when application works well in development, but as soon as we push it uh, into uh, production and put it under a load, uh, the processing time goes exponentially. And that's where monitoring can help you because you can see, okay, now request time for um, goes up and we see the number of database requests, we correlate those to metrics, and if we see that a number of database requests also grows exponentially, this might indicate an error in your application. For example, one very popular error is n plus one request, when your application doesn't uh, use SQL to uh, get all information it needed in one round trip to database, but instead talk uh, to uh, database for uh, iterate over all items in uh, some database. This is very common and it's very easily, um, to, easy to see when you compare a number of database requests with a number of items in a particular uh, table. Uh, and finally, I want uh, the last topic for today is how we can uh, use remote debugger in .NET application. So um, I want to uh, tell about this on uh, using 
uh, ISP.NET Core application is a sample deployed uh, to a Linux container. And I will talk about Windows in the end of my presentation as well. So uh, this diagram illustrates how this process works. So inside Cloud Foundry, we have a .NET process running. And in order for .NET debugger to be able to attach uh, to, attach to your uh, application, you need to use special software that can uh, help you. So in case of Linux containers, we use VSDBG application that should be uh, installed in the application container, and VSDBG is responsible for monitoring your process, and then VSDBG talks to debugger and actually is responsible for uh, uh, executing all debugger commands. In order for this to work, we need a special file that is called launch.json, and this file can be used to configure uh, debug in uh, VS Code. Uh, it is possible to use uh, launch JSON in v Visual Studio, but in Visual Studio, uh, there is no native support for uh, launch JSON, so you need to type a few comments from uh, command window if you want to do this. Uh, but if somebody is interested, you can uh, connect to me after presentation, I can show you how it works. But from VS Code, you just create this file, there is a native support for this. And uh, what's important here? Important thing here is how we connect to remote debugger. Do you see that we use CF CLI? There is a command, so it's called pipe program, it's called uh, CF, we use CF and then pipe arguments, so we use CF SSH to go inside container. Then we specify name of our application, and dash C means uh, commands that uh, we want to execute inside container. And VS Code attach actual command where, uh, that launch VSDBG and attach uh, to uh, running.NET process. Uh, in order for this to work, obviously we need VSDBG to be installed alongside our .NET app. And here is a sample of a Docker file that can uh, do this. So what is done here is that we are using two containers. The first one is used to build our app. We execute publish command here. And the second container uses output of the first one. And uh, it runs our application. This is done in the last line. Here you see that we use, uh, we uh, dynamically create URL uh, to run our application. And uh, we also install VSDBG alongside with some other uh, packages that uh, are required for VSDBG to uh, run inside container. So after you done something like this, this is rather simple Docker file, what you can do is to just use normal CF push to push your .NET application into a Linux container. And uh, here uh, you specify name of your con uh, container, you should put it in uh, Docker Hub or your private uh, Docker registry. And after you uh, done this, or via Studio Code, we'll show you a dialog similar to this. Here you can uh, see all processes running on inside remote container. So you can just pick the uh, .NET process, the ones that you are interested in, and basically you are done. You connect it to the um, application that is uh, running inside container. Uh, so on Windows, we, uh, when doing uh, application dojos, we uh, previously, most of the times, what we did is to uh, use some hacks to uh, get inside VMs uh, that, uh, that uh, runs on Windows. Uh, and usually we deploy a, a separate VM, debugger VM, in the same network, and then I install Visual Studio on this VM and use RDP to connect to this VM, and uh, just use native Visual Studio debugging uh, debugger uh, to debug our application. So Cloud Foundry was not involved. And actually, this is not a cool solution because you need to uh, access, um, you need your operation team to help you with this. Just as a developer, you cannot just deploy VM in the same network as your Diego cells, um, to the same network where your Diego cells are host. Uh, but uh, I uh, advise you to attend uh, tomorrow's keynote because uh, tomorrow Pivotal is going to announce uh, support for native uh, debugger 
uh, on Windows, and that's a very cool feature, and you can uh, use Visual Studio to attach to any remote process that runs uh, inside Cloud Foundry. So I'm very excited about this announcement, and I definitely want to check out how it works, so I, I hope they'll show us a live demo on, on this. Uh, and a last thing that I want to uh, tell you is that uh, actually I, um, so sometimes it's, uh, um, you are forced to use debugger because you don't have any other way to troubleshoot an, an issue. But uh, if you have to rely heavily on debug, especially in production, this might indicate that you have problems with your architecture and uh, problems with your uh, login uh, infrastructure. Probably you are not logging enough information and you can troubleshoot it. The problem with debug is that it's a spent state. So actually, you cannot uh, debug uh, application, uh, like live applications that works under load that, uh, be uh, because as soon as you attach to a process, the process is stopped. And another problem is that we cannot use debugger for uh, post issues. If somebody complains about your application and uh, you cannot reproduce the issue, uh, you basically don't have uh, a lot of um, opportunities to troubleshoot it using debugger. So in such situation, uh, logs are much more helpful for uh, troubleshooting. And uh, if you uh, want to see how all uh, this works in practice, you can check out my uh, repository that uh, implements the sample applications that I have just shown. It's very simple uh, default uh, .NET uh, core application that I um, uh, that has all those features that I have just shown you. Uh, so you can uh, clone it and play around with it if you want. So basically, that's it that I uh, want to share with you. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask them. I will try to to answer all of them. Uh, uh, you mean debug during sorry, development? Log, sorry, log as much as possible. So not log as much as possible, but instead I recommend to, uh, when logging something, just have clear picture in mind why you are logging this, in what case you want to log this. So uh, uh, I recommend logging uh, such things that uh, can't be logged transparently for your application, such as I mentioned previously, all request data, all database data, it, uh, it ensures consistent login format. But I cannot say I recommend log as much as possible because I see uh, a lot of times code like this, like one line of code and, uh, okay, we are calculating parameter X, then we are talking to database, and uh, this makes your code less readable Instead, it's much uh, more useful to uh, have a wrapper that will log everything that you log to database and get rid of this login code from your business logic. So that's uh, how I see a good debugger implement, uh, good login implementation in the application. Uh, dynamically turn what? Uh, up or down. Uh, like, so, first off, is logging, if it's logged, there is a lot of logging, how do you impact the performance of that? I, I see. Yeah, uh, that's a perfect question. Yeah, so most of the loggers support uh, doing this, and uh, one common way uh, of uh, doing this is provide you a logger configuration that externalize from your application. Instead of doing the things that I have been doing, like hard code, the logger level, you can use uh, a JSON file to configure your logger levels for different namespaces. And uh, also, uh, some logger libraries support uh, uh, 
configuration based on environment variables. So uh, you can uh, set environment variable, restart your application. If you have a lot of instances, they, they will be restarted one by one, so there will be no downtime, and you can dynamically adjust uh, login level. But important thing here is that, uh, okay, uh, if we are logging a lot, how we can avoid impacting the performance of our application. So first of all, in your uh, log aggregator, in such uh, tools like ELK, you can set up uh, a special process that will clean up all logs, and uh, you can set up policy, for example, all logs um, older than uh, one month should be deleted, or for example, we keep error logs for forever, and we delete debug logs uh, as soon as uh, one week, for example, and this can be very useful. But in terms of slowing down application itself, uh, well, I don't think it has a uh, very uh, like extremely large impact on application because a lot of logger libraries introduce intermediate buffers. So instead of just writing each time to log file or to standard out, they log everything into file and then flush it periodically. So uh, I never seen problems with uh, application performance because we are logging too, uh, too much. All right, anything else? <coughs> Questions there? Yeah? All right, thanks everybody.